for Onward. It's a topic we've done a lot of work on. For those of you who haven't seen our research on this, I could please urge you to check out two excellent research papers we've done. The first, Rocket Science on the UK's strengths and some weaknesses. Some say they do exist on science and tech. And the second, on incentivizing innovation, examining R&D tax credits. And we've got much more to come on this in 2023. So if you haven't signed up to our newsletter to be the first to hear about Onward's research, then please go and do that. Now, this is the first in a two-part series. Um, the first, delighted to welcome George Freeman here today. But the second part is taking place tomorrow at 4 p.m. where we've got a webinar hosted by our Deputy Director, Adam Hawksby. And we've got a very illustrious panel of people discussing the topics we're going to be looking at today, including Sir John Bell of Oxford University, Tabitha Gozhub, who is chair of the AI Council, Lord David Willett, the former universities minister, James Phillips, the former number 10 science advisor, Priya Gur, who's the UK's former council general in Silicon Valley, and Richard Jones, the University of Manchester. So if you've not signed up for that, it's 4 p.m. tomorrow, and I think you will all very much enjoy it. But before all that, we're absolutely delighted onward to welcome George Freeman here today to be discussing what life might be like beyond Horizon Europe. I'm sure all of you know George. He's been the MP for Mid-Norfolk since 2010 and Science Minister since September 2021 and I'm sure you'll all agree there is no greater champion enthusiast for the UK's science prowess and today he's going to be talking to us about a taster of what life might be like for UK science if we don't remain in Horizon Europe. So you all please come together and welcome to the stage George Freeman MP. Well, Seb, thank you, and uh, welcome and good morning to all of you here and to the 500 or so online out there. Um, can I just start by saying, you know, good politics needs good think tanks, and think tanks come and go. Uh, Onward is doing brilliant work, and I just wanted to thank you for putting this together, a two-part panel, my speech and Q&A today, uh, and then the panel tomorrow with, as you've just heard, some real leaders in this sector. This is a big debate for the UK, and Onward is really helping to shape it. And also, Seb, a personal thank you to you. There's been no greater champion of leveling up and the importance of the modern economy, science, technology, research, and innovation in driving leveling up, which should be one of my key themes today. I think this is your first event in your new role at Onward, so it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's a particular pleasure. Lots of familiar faces here today. Uh, for me, as Seb has said, I've spent 12 years in Parliament. As Michael Gove quipped at the last reshuffle when someone said, what are you doing? He said, he's He's doing what he's always doing. He's pushing, banging the drum for science, research, technology, and innovation. And I, having had a 15-year career in venture capital and starting companies and uh, experiencing the uh, difficulties of building world-class businesses from great ideas with good support in the UK and funding that whole ecosystem, it's a real privilege and a pleasure to be the other side, uh, the minister uh, in the UK for science, research, and innovation, and technology at Bayes and uh, to be able to bring some of that perspective and experience into government. Uh, there's an old joke in Parliament, which some find funnier than others, that if you come to Parliament with any experience or expertise in the sector, uh, the wits will probably make sure that you don't end up working in that, uh, in that uh, area. And I've been lucky enough to uh, be the exception to that rule, uh, to that, uh, rule uh, in four roles as Minister for Life Science in the coalition when we set out that groundbreaking 10-year first industrial strategy in the Coalition for Life Science, and we launched the genomics program. I mean, there was a moonshot for you, if there ever was one. We decided we were going to announce to sequence the entire genome of 100,000 NHS patients connected to their database, NHS volunteer patients, and make the UK a leader in genomics. Well, it worked. Uh, it paid off. And boy, did it pay off in the pandemic. And that was one of the reasons we were able to be so advanced in sequencing the uh, genome of the uh, uh, virus and to develop the vaccine. But it also drove billions of inward investment. And in many ways, it's that experience that I'm bringing into this role now across government. We want to do that again across multiple sectors. Uh, following my spell as Minister for Life Science, uh, I was Minister for Agritech, and again, another huge sector where the UK is a world leader and we've got huge opportunities. Uh, worked with Will Tanner in number 10 in the Theresa May government. Uh, where Theresa May rightly, I think, put a big focus on place uh, and, and that the industrial strategy needed to be balanced by sectors, uh, but also by place. Uh, and then as Minister for the Future Transport at DFT and now in this role. 
And why am I so driven by this? Well, it's very simple. Because I think uh, the last decade has proven beyond all reasonable doubt that we need a more resilient, sustainable model of economic growth. And yes, we are a world-class leader in financial services and in the service economy. But I think through our 40 odd years in the European Union, it's accelerated the servicification of the UK economy. And the last 10 years have shown that we need to be investing in the industries of tomorrow, backing the science and technology that will drive the high growth sectors. The way we'll get our trend economy up to 2-3% growth is to be home to sectors growing at 20, 30, 50% a year. We've got those sectors here. This is all about growing them for UK economic prosperity, but also key theme of today for global geopolitical influence and global security. And part of what the last uh, decade, but also the last year have shown, the horrific invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the supply chain pressure, uh, the tensions geopolitically with China, the semiconductors, the, the resilience of the globalization of supply chains, I think has, uh, has been drawn into stark relief. And all of us are aware that we have to back industrial resilience. And we need to think a bit more about, as we are as a government, our supply chains uh, and our industrial strength uh, and resilience going forwards. But there's something else that I want to suggest, which is science actually is as key to our international geopolitical security as our military capabilities. And uh, I say that because if you look at the next decade, the big uh, causes of geopolitical tension uh, are going to be about resources, water pressure, feeding 9 billion mouths by 2050. That means doubling world food production on the same land area with half as much water and energy. The challenge of climate change, of uh, preventing huge migrations out of less developed areas, uh, supporting sustainable development, agri-tech in Africa. These are big global challenges, and they're the challenges that drive the geopolitical tensions that drive global insecurities. So uh, part of this is about, as we set out in the integrated review, a recognition that our science, research, technology, and innovation isn't just uh, about academic prowess, vital and central and primary though that is, it's also about the UK uh, building economic resilience and helping to build global economic resilience and sustainability. So what are we doing about it? Well, um, I should just say that uh, if I'm passionate, we are very lucky to have in this Prime Minister and this Chancellor uh, two people who are every bit as passionate, and I've never seen such support for this agenda uh, as we're seeing in the last uh, few months and uh, years. And that's in no small part due to Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt. He was my Secretary of State at the Department of Health. They get this. They really get it. And that's why, let me just spin through some of the things that we've done in government. Firstly, to set up the NSTC, the National Science and Technology Council, alongside the National Security Council. It's the cabinet body that is charged with taking the big decisions that the agenda I've just set out demands. It's chaired by the Prime Minister, Secretary of State, uh, for Bayes sits on it and I sit in it uh, as Minister for Science, Research, Technology and Innovation alongside Patrick Vallance. And I just wanted to take this moment to pay tribute to Patrick Vallance as Chief Scientific Advisor and Chief Technology Advisor in Government before uh, his time passes uh, shortly this spring. He's been an extraordinary strength in the UK science and research ecosystem, behind the scenes as well as publicly. And I just want to put on record on behalf of the Government our thanks to Patrick for all that he's done. So the NSTC, the architecture and government to take the big decisions. Secondly, funding. And Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister last year and Chancellor Jeremy Hunt in this necessarily difficult autumn statement this autumn has ring-fenced the commitment. It's a 30% increase in UK R&D. We're going from 15 billion a year to 20 billion a year in the UK in this CSR. Thirdly, we've uh, committed to pass the bill and are now in the process of setting up ARIA, the UK um, response to the DARPA uh, success. It's a free agency to do really bold, innovative, advanced research, invention, uh, and uh, science research and discovery. And uh, it's 800 million ring fence funding for a really exciting, bold, free project. But we're going further, and the pension reforms in the city are designed to make sure that we can harness, finally, the great power of the City of London to support our science and technology base. So we're not just a startup incubator globally with companies floating. Uh, increasingly on NASDAQ, but we start to really connect the muscle of the City of London as a financial centre to our science base. And finally, and perhaps uh, you know, most excitingly, to use the opportunities of post-Brexit regulatory freedom 
to set the international standards in these new and exciting sectors, from autonomous vehicles to AI to agri-tech to med-tech. We've got a chance, which we're determined to take, to be agile, to be digital, to be advanced, to be pro progressive, to move quickly and set the regulatory pathways so the UK becomes the global testbed for innovations and we become the research uh, test bed for gathering the data for enlightened regulation and set the international standards in these new sectors. Uh, let me just talk about the funding because it's an important part of this. We, you don't get to do world-class science on a shoestring. So uh, firstly, we set out a commitment to reach the 2.4% target, which has been an important target in the UK. We've been historically in the last 40 years uh, in the lower half of the OECD R&D uh, spending commitment and we set that target to get to 2.4 percent. I'm delighted the ONS have now this year confirmed that we're actually uh, they're doing the final numbers but we're just short of three we've we've got to 2.8 or so. Great news and it suggests that the last 10-15 years have worked. It was a stretch target and we're now looking at what the next realistic stretch target is but we need to be serious about this if uh, if we want to be a global science superpower we have to make sure we're investing properly. And if you look, uh, uh, Israel, I think, are at uh, just over 4%, Switzerland are at 3.8%. Um, we've got a big economy, so it's a large sum, but we are making real success, and we'll shortly be setting out, as soon as we get detail for the ONS, what the next target is. But crucially, over this CSR, it's a 30% increase. We're going to 20 billion a year in the UK. Uh, that's really important security for our research community. But here's the real key, if we want to be a science superpower, we have to leverage that public funding to attract much more private funding. And traditionally, science has worked on a sort of three to one private uh, ratio. So we are working through, in Bayes at the moment, a business plan for how we can turn that extra 30% public into substantial uh, two or three X private funding over the next five, 10 years. Uh, how much can we raise in life sciences, in space, in quantum, in fusion, in agri-tech, and start to think about them as business units in the UK economy. Uh, people can invest not just in companies, of course, but also in funds, in clusters, in infrastructure, in science parks, and we want to set out, and I'll say a bit more about this in a moment, a compelling opportunity for UK and international investors to invest in our science infrastructure. Uh, that's why we've set up a new unit in Bayes to uh, plan through how we uh, deliver that private investment, and we're working very closely with DIT, and I want to pay tribute to uh, Jerry Grimstone, who was a phenomenal powerhouse of support in this, and his successor, Dominic Johnson, who I'm working closely with. We want to be able to go around the world and make very clear to people how you can invest in UK science, research, technology, and innovation in sectors, in companies, but also in clusters. And that's why uh, Michael Gove set out so powerfully in the Leveling Up White Paper a commitment to R&D beyond the Golden Triangle around the country to help drive levelling up. And it's why I've set up, I'm responsible for 75 odd percent of that total UK R&D figure, but the other key departments, MOD, DH, DFT, uh, DEFRA, uh, uh, also have substantial R&D budgets and I've set up an informal interministerial group so that we as ministers and the chief scientists in those departments can support the NSTC with joined up Whitehall delivery. So that's the UK funding landscape. Let me just turn to the international in two parts, Europe and globally. So in Europe, uh, the big three programs, obviously Horizon, Copernicus and Euratom, uh, we negotiated very carefully in that uh, uh, Brexit deal uh, at the end of 2020 uh, and in the uh, trade continuity agreement very careful to negotiate our membership of Horizon, Copernicus, and Euratom. We never wanted to leave those programs. We still don't, and we're still pushing uh, for that association to be formalized. Uh, just to uh, put on record so people are aware the, uh, how those programs are structured, so Copernicus is the Earth Observation Program, and we have made sure that uh, in the last year, through our space budget, uh, we've committed to 400-odd million in Earth Observation uh, 300 of which I've just put back into the European Space Agency Earth Observation Programs in which the, uh, the UK uh, sector plays a key role and we've got 100 million through the Space Agency here in the UK for Earth Observation. It's a key sector. And on Euratom, we've been privileged and delighted to host uh, the uh, joint European Taurus at uh, Cullum, which this year set out that, those spectacular results alongside the Livermore Lab in the US. Fusion energy, commercial fusion energy now within reach and we're determined to deploy that, and we're working with UKAA to 
invest and support the industrialization of fusion. Uh, so uh, those two, uh, we have strong plans in place. Uh, we're still pushing to be involved in those, to be associated in those two programs. But let me turn to Horizon, because it's the big one. It's the world's biggest research club. It's over seven years, about 95 billion euros. The UK has been one of the top two or three players uh, for years. Uh, and we put in, uh, I think in the last round, it was 14-odd uh, billion. Uh, and we get back, quote unquote, get back about 90% of that, because uh, the UK research sector is so strong, and we end up, through our universities and our institutes, leading so many of those research programs. And that's why we've been so committed to uh, uh, pushing to complete that association, and we continue to do so. It's in three pillars. The talent pillar, uh, which is completely key. Uh, we have in the UK a very, very high proportion of the top ERC professors. They are senior people anchoring key labs and we want to make sure that uh, they're able to remain here, either through ERC membership or through our supporting them. There's an industry pillar. Um, uh, we don't do so well on the industry pillar, but there's some important projects for companies like Rolls-Royce and a lot of university small companies. Uh, at the innovation pillar, you might expect us to be a big beneficiary. Actually, we're not, uh, interestingly, which I think is to do with the way this, uh, that pillar is structured. It's quite academic uh, and perhaps not suited to small companies so much. So uh, that's the picture in terms of uh, what we're currently doing through the European programs and globally, beyond Europe, uh, we've invested heavily in the last few years in the Newton Fund and the GCRF and uh, those programs, the continuation through this CSR is about 400 million uh, and I've just announced before Christmas with the Chancellor the first tranche of the International Science Partnership Fund which is the successor, 119 million. So in this CSR it's about half a billion for global science and research. So that's the picture uh, today. Let me just set out the mission that we are pursuing. Uh, many of you will have heard me refer to these terms, and I want to unpack them so that they're clear. Science superpower and innovation nation. And why do I put it that way? Well, for this reason. Being a science superpower is different from being an academic powerhouse. I mean, it is built on that academic leadership, um, but it's a slightly different uh, agenda. And I want to define it for you, as I did in Tokyo in my big speech before Christmas. Being a science superpower, I think, means a few really key things. Firstly, continuing to be an academic powerhouse. If you're not leading in the uh, key academic blue sky discovery research, that's the pillar on which everything is built. Secondly, for global impact. We want to make sure that we're using our science leadership to help tackle the great global challenges from climate change to uh, clean oceans, safe space, agri-tech, the big challenges I just talked about. Thirdly, Global careers, you know, science is a collaborative venture and we need to make sure that the best scientists here in the UK can go internationally and come back and the best international scientists can come here. Fourthly, industrial R&D. If we're going to be a powerhouse in this global economy, we have to attract much more international money. There is a wall of money out there. And the number of people who say to me, I'd love to invest in this ecosystem, how can I? Uh, so that, that's why I'm confident that we've got the opportunity to do it, but do it, we must. Fifth, it's about values and insisting that good science, and uh, I use the term scientia to mean not just a pretentious Latinate word, but the whole culture of science. You can't do science behind a closed wall. You can't do science without a commitment to free speech, to free thinking, to open data, to sharing, to peer review. And if we're going to be a muscular force for science in the world, then we have to have that fight and get behind the values behind open science, which do underpin free speech and free societies and liberal democracies. So research security is a key part of that. And finally, harnessing all of that demonstrable UK commitment for heightened geopolitical soft power and influence. And this is a part of the agenda I think often gets overlooked. I'm very privileged as Minister for Science Research and Innovation to have 120 science research technology and innovation staff around the world in the Science and Innovation Network embedded in our embassies. That's how strong the global commitment is in the UK. We need to use it to make sure we're really attracting uh, that investment and growing that geopolitical footprint. And that's why in the last uh, 15 months, I've been around the world uh, to Israel, to Switzerland, to Japan, to the big R&D countries to establish and set up uh, deeper R&D collaborations with those countries, all uh, in the same format, three pillars, deep science collaboration, commercial collaboration, and government public policy uh, uh, collaboration. And through the G7 and the G20, through the Eureka, the Northern European Ministerial, pushing to make clear that the UK is ambitious to be a global force through Europe 
and beyond. And we're looking at a whole range of opportunities. Uh, you know, in a world where China is spending uh, annually 240 odd billion dollars, uh, America's at 180 science. If you include a lot of the defense science, it's near 300 billion. We're going to 20, which is brilliant. But we're going to have to make sure that is the most impactful 20 billion in the world and that it's attracting inward investment and that we are deploying it globally in a realistic way. And there's a whole raft of areas from biosecurity to post pandemic resilience to polar research to clean space to agri tech. There's a whole range of areas where the UK is widely regarded as a leader. We have the capability to convene global collaborations, and we're looking at how we might be able to do that more actively in the coming months and years. So the innovation nation piece, why is that so key? My argument is that we can't be a science superpower if we're not also an innovation nation. And what I mean by that is if we're not also nurturing a domestic economic commitment to innovation as the Prime Minister set out in his speech last week. That means great universities, great technology transfer, great startups, and we are a powerhouse now in that sector. But it then means the next bit, scaling them up, uh, growing the big companies here in the UK, uh, using our catapult network to attract much bigger industrial R&D, taking our companies to the city and floating them here, financing them here, building, as we do in, in the digital economy, in AI, so many of the uh, big so-called unicorn companies, the billion pound flotations here in London, uh, we want to make sure we're also doing that in the broader science uh, sector as well. But it's also about, crucially, the clusters around this country. We do have the great golden cluster of Cambridge, Oxford, London. It's called the Golden Triangle for a reason, from Shanghai to San Diego to Singapore. People look at that, and it is on a par with Silicon Valley, the Bay Area in Boston. It is a world-class triangle. Uh, but we've set out a commitment both to develop it, but also to nurture the other clusters all around the UK. And the exciting thing about the new economy and the, the pace of these technologies is that they go all around the country, from agri-tech in my part of the world in Norfolk to the space uh, cluster down in Newquay in Cornwall to compound semiconductors in South Wales, uh, robotics in Warwick, marine technology on the south coast, uh, satellite technology in Glasgow, uh, the bioeconomy in Yorkshire. We're mapping them. There's about 30 of these clusters. They're real. They're all at different stages of development. Uh, some are very mature. Some are just taking shape. But we want to make sure that we're nurturing them all around the country, not just so that we become a true innovation nation, a true innovation economy, but so that everyone in this country can have a chance to benefit from the extraordinary opportunities, the careers, uh, the prosperity that this sector is creating. And that's why, Seb, I think it's such a pleasure to be here at Onward today, given the work you've done and that Onward have done on leveling up. But there's something else which traditionally hasn't been in our science and research and technology agenda, which is using the post-Brexit freedoms of procurement and regulation. Whether you voted for it or not, we now have the chance to use our regulatory freedom to set the standards and to use the levers of HMG to drive enlightened procurement. We've done it in all sorts of ways, but in a rather patchy way across different, uh, different areas of government over the years. And we've made the commitment to be much more strategic about supporting key science, research, and technology. The Department of Health uh, are doing it perhaps uh, in the greatest degree through life sciences, but we can do it in other areas too. And I want to highlight particularly uh, the cluster point. You know, traditionally, uh, in Bayes, in government, we've announced really important projects, really important funds, really important funding, but I don't think we've focused enough on how the clusters around the country are actually growing and what they actually need. Now, there have been PhD theses written, books written, uh, libraries filled on the science of clusters. I want to use a very simple definition which is rooted in my experience of working around those clusters for 15 years. Uh, we're thinking about clusters as places in which people take risks in pursuit of opportunities. Now, the risk could be, as a scientist, leaving the safety of a university job and doing a startup. The risk could be an entrepreneur mortgaging their house to start a company. Uh, there are all sorts of risks, places in which people take risks in pursuit of opportunities. And the best definition of a cluster I've still ever heard is from Dr. Andy Richards, founder of Vectura, a great Cambridge biotech angel, who said, look, a cluster is a low-risk place to move your family for you to pursue a career in a high-risk sector. And what he means by that is, it isn't a high risk to move your family to Cambridge. If your particular company doesn't work, there'll be hundreds of others, thousands actually. And, and that is a key insight that actually clusters are about people in that area uh, 
Yes, it's about infrastructure, but it's also about the culture, the education, the environment, the landscape. If we're going to attract the best people from around the world, we have to make sure that our clusters are also attractive places for people to come and live. And that's why we've set up in Bayes a new unit to look at uh, integrating our various tracking uh, research cluster data. We're working with DIT and we'll shortly be setting out a new integrated tool for digital tracking of these clusters both as a policy tool in Bayes, but also as a tool for local leaders to see what the obstacles, what the barriers are, and where we can help. And I think by being a little bit more scientific, dare I say it, about what's holding a cluster back, is it skills? Is it a lack of opportunity? Is it a lack of public funding? Is it infrastructure? By being a bit clearer about what's holding each cluster back, I think we can get much more bang for our buck and support those clusters to grow and develop and attract that private funding that I talked about. And I want to pay tribute to Michael Gove, who's been a huge supporter of this agenda through the leveling up uh, white paper. And if you look at what's going on around the country, we're seeing a quiet revolution in long-term funding. The work that John Godfrey, Legal and General are doing, the work that Northern Gritstone Fund are doing, Cambridge Innovation Capital, the Oxford funds, there are some long-term funds now beginning to deploy really substantial money, uh, much bigger money than I saw when I was in this sector 20 years ago around the UK, and big investment in infrastructure for regional growth. If we get this right, I think in 10 years we'll be able to look back and say what really drove levelling up was that first bit of leadership, public sector funding, and then the freedom for these clusters to attract really significant private funding into this science research and innovation space. So that's why I make the case that to be a science superpower, we have to be an innovation nation. If we're not an innovation nation, we're simply an academic powerhouse. Uh, and that is a magnificent thing, but we have an opportunity now to harness, harness that leadership for both domestic economic prosperity, but also that global security that I talked about. And if you look at uh, the international dimension, I want to make the case that this whole agenda, science, research, technology, and innovation, is becoming increasingly global. And that's partly because of the uh, increasingly sophisticated, collaborative nature of modern science. Uh, yes, there are extraordinary individuals who have a eureka moment in labs, but increasingly, world-class science is about deep, collaborative work with very expensive infrastructure, data sharing. It's much more collaborative. But it's also to do with the urgency of those challenges that I talked about in food, in medicine, in energy, climate change, uh, tackling that agri-tech challenge, we face as a generation a 10-year challenge uh, on climate change, on sustainable development, on agriculture, food, medicine, uh, to make sure that we uh, substantially and rapidly make the global economic development uh, uh, process more sustainable and more resilient. And I mean, if you look at COVID, I think in this country, uh, probably in the last 12 years, the things that most people are most proud of. I think they'd say Her Majesty the Queen, the Olympics in 2012, and our success on the COVID vaccine. It was an extraordinary moment to see the whole of Wimbledon rise to their feet, rightly, to salute Professor Sarah Gilbert and all the team at Oxford. This country is good at this. It wants to be good at this. It knows it's good at this. And this is an agenda, I think, that not just helps show that Britain's best days are ahead of us in tackling global challenges, but gives a new generation the hope that they need to be inspired about this country and their own futures. With, the truth is we're in a global race for science, research, technology, leadership, and a global race for the geodiplomatic influence that comes with it. And that was why we set out in the integrated review, and we're reviewing that uh, uh, th uh, this year, uh, how we can make sure that we're using our leadership more strategically. So let me come to Horizon. We are still, for the record, committed pushing to associate. I was in Paris just before Christmas, uh, and the Prime Minister is investing in uh, uh, hugely improved relations across uh, Europe, all of which has been accelerated, actually, by the horrors of Ukraine and the recognition that we are, whatever our differences politically, uh, as a European uh, region, uh, we have a lot more in common than divides us, and our, our security, both in the military sense but also in the economic sense, is, is very... Uh, uh, yeah, interdependent. Uh, so we're still pushing, and I'm still hopeful, and across Europe, the science leaders, the research leaders, the member states, uh, I've yet to find a member state that doesn't say, we really want the UK in Horizon, uh, but it's caught up in the high politics of the bigger post-Brexit relationship. 
So that's why we have moved in this last year to make sure that while we push for association, uh, the UK research sector is properly supported. We set out the in-flight funding guarantee, so for the projects that are going through would have had Horizon funding that we'd have put in and received back, we're funding them through the UK funding guarantee that I set out a year ago and have recently renewed. Secondly, we've made clear that we'll honour that commitment that the Prime Minister, now Prime Minister, then Chancellor made a year ago, that the money that we've, we would have been uh, uh, receiving on Horizon, we commit to UK R&D. Uh, thirdly, the Chancellor, after the autumn statement, before Christmas, set out that £480 million Horizon relief package of funding for the UK universities that are most uh, seriously affected and the projects and the companies. And it's why, just before Christmas, I set out that £119 million first tranche of the International Science Partnership Fund. But let me be very clear for all those watching today that we cannot allow UK research to be benched, great UK researchers and scientists to be benched, spectating on this uh, uh, in incredibly exciting period in science and research. And as I've said elsewhere before, if we can't play in the European Cup of Science, then we'll simply have to go and play in the World Cup of Science, which is why I set out clearly at the beginning those ratios of funding. So we've spent this last year working very closely with the sector based on and that's why I set out earlier the structure of Horizon, based on uh, understanding where, if we were to deploy the resources we want to put into Horizon in an alternative program, where we could and should be focusing. And we haven't yet finalized that package as we set out in a prospectus in the summer. Uh, I'll just outline our thinking. Firstly, there's a talent piece. It's absolutely key, and actually our UK ecosystem, in any case, needs to have a bolder offer in terms of early career, mid-career, late-stage career, uh, uh, pathways and we're determined to make sure that we have a much bolder offer in terms of global fellowships. Uh, secondly, we're looking at the innovation, the industrial challenges, the technology piece and a pillar around uh, fleshing out those NSTC commitments to the big missions, the moonshots, uh, to those big uh, opportunities to deploy UK technology much more strategically. And then thirdly, a big global pillar looking at how we could deepen those both uh, bilateral relationships with key R&D economies, as I've discussed, and also looking at opportunities for some potential uh, global collaborative multilateral projects around urgent challenges. And then fourthly, perhaps not a pillar, but a platform underpinning it, investment in world-class infrastructure. Great science needs great uh, resources and facilities, and our super-fast computing, Daresbury, Synchrotron, Harwell, Cullum, these campuses need public investment through our public sector research establishments in infrastructure, and that's why that was part of that pre-Christmas package. Crucially, uh, we are listening and working with the sector. I meet research leaders uh, pretty much every week, and we are uh, working in the coming weeks to define this package. Uh, it's now with the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, the Cabinet, the NSTC, and you'll be hearing in the coming months and around the budget a much uh, clearer picture of how we intend to start to deploy this funding if we can't secure association. Crucially, uh, this links to the innovation nation piece. If we get this right, it's my belief that we can then help to support that inward investment that I talked about, to create those career paths here in the UK, so that inspiring young Brits all around this country, from Northern Ireland to Wales and Scotland, uh, to the windy outreaches of the UK, from uh, Cornwall to north of Scotland, everyone can have a chance to take part in this inspiring economy. Uh, but it's also about the UK as a global regulatory innov innovation testbed. We set that out in the innovation strategy last year, and the Prime Minister rightly focused on this in his speech last week. And as many of you know here today, I I've made the case very loudly that um, there is a huge opportunity in our regulatory freedoms. Uh, of course, yes, to get rid of daft regulations that we don't need, but much more importantly, I would argue, in setting the new, agile, digital, responsive regulatory frameworks for these new technologies. Because the truth is, whether it's autonomous vehicles or AI or nutraceuticals or med tech, what actually investors need is confidence that there's a regulatory pathway, confidence that if they come to the UK, we may not be paying the highest price. In fact, I can guarantee through the NHS, we don't pay top prices. We don't pay uh, expensive prices for the latest technologies. What we do do is provide access to uh, incredible facilities, incredible NHS hospitals, research hospitals, and data. And the opportunity for the UK is to be a global testbed 
And that's why, as Minister for Life Science, I set out that accelerated access reform uh, which successive ministers have taken forward. The opportunity for us is to be a global testbed. You come here to get your innovation proven to work in the UK. You get the data package. Uh, and that's a strategic opportunity for the UK. And it's why in the recent Tigger report, the Task Force on Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform that I and uh, Ian Duncan Smith and Theresa Villiers set out when I was a backbencher, uh, we've set out the case that the UK should grip this opportunity and set out a regulatory framework in which we celebrate our regulators, promote great regulation, uh, uh, inspire all of our regulators to learn from the MHRA experience in the pandemic, uh, and uh, to be leaders in the economy of tomorrow and to change the way we think about regulation. And it's why in Bayes we're backing the Regulatory Pioneers Fund and helping to support those test beds all around the UK. Some of these clusters I talked about are actually, their principal offer may well be to be test beds. The Northamptonshire Autonomous Vehicle Corridor is already beginning to be recognized globally, Milton Keynes, as the autonomous vehicle test bed. The South Coast Marine Technology Corridor becoming already the place you want to come and test your underwater drones, your autonomous submarines, and all of that port technology. So there's an opportunity here for us to develop some of these clusters as regulatory test beds. Let me just close by saying, uh, it's true, Seb, that I'm passionate about this, and why? It's because I think not only does this agenda create the opportunity for us to build a more sustainable, resilient, productive economy, to get out of the uh, cycle of uh, boom and bust, that being a, uh, an over-reliant service economy inevitably uh, makes us uh, more vulnerable to. This is the deep industrial and new, new economies of tomorrow are growing substantially. That's guaranteed. So by having a greater exposure, a greater presence of those companies here in the UK, I think it'll give us a much stronger economic uh, commitment to resilience and prosperity uh, as a UK PLC. Uh, and that is crucial because that's how we generate the money that pays for the modern public services. And there's an exciting part of public service innovation in this, uh, in the NHS, but also in, uh, in government. The digitalization of government creates opportunities for us to be more of a test bed in terms of adopting innovation in public services to drive that productivity. But it's also about leveling up. I think if we get this right, we'll, we'll create that private, long-term, sustainable funding flow to drive forward the regional economic prosperity around the country and to create that rebalanced economy that we've set out. But it's also, perhaps more importantly, about opportunity and to give people around this country the chance to partake in what I think is the most exciting bit of our economy. But there's something even more that I want to close on, which is it'll give this country, I think, if we can look globally and be a more active player, a more muscular player in tackling those gro global grand challenges, I think it'll help answer that old challenge from Dean Acheson that Britain lost an empire and it's not sure what its role is yet. I think there's an opportunity for us post-Brexit to unlock a much stronger global commitment, the UK as a science superpower and an innovation nation, helping tackle those global challenges. And I think that is not only inspiring for this country, but for the next generation to believe that this country's best days are ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, we're working there. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much, George. There's an awful lot to unpack there, and we're going to have time for some questions now. Before we do, just for all those joining us online, I'd like to remind you about the second part of this series, looking at life potentially beyond Horizon Europe, with our webinar tomorrow, which is at 4 p.m., hosted by um, Onwards Deputy Director Adam Hawksby. And with that, we've got Sir John Bell from Oxford University, um, Tabitha Gultrub, who's chair of the AI Council, Lord David Willits, who's the former science minister, James Phillips, the former number 10 science advisor, Priya Gu, who is the UK's ex consular general in Silicon Valley, and Richard Jones of Manchester University. So please go online, sign up to hear as we unpack more of this. Now, George, you need to pick up a microphone there, I think, so everyone can hear you. I'm going to use Chair's prerogative to put two questions to you before we go out to the audience there. First of all, you talked a lot about leveling up in this, and I'm, this is obviously something I've cared deeply about, but there's always that tension between the areas you've already got agglomeration, you talked about the golden triangle, and some people would say if you want to get that growth, if you want those quick wins, then just keep investing where you know you can get returns. How do you manage that tension? And then the second thing I wanted to ask you was about the Horizon Europe questions, the large sums of money we're talking about here 
if we do achieve associate membership, is there a cost-benefit balance to that versus doing things differently in our own way? Yeah, thanks, Ed. Look, two great questions. Um, so on the, the golden triangle versus regional cluster point, um, crucially, it's not a choice, as I tried to make clear in the speech. The golden triangle is golden for a reason. Uh, and uh, my argument is that we need to continue to support that Oxford, Cambridge, London triangle. Uh, so it's not a question of undermining that in order to uh, shift funding outside. It's about making sure that as we grow this new economy in the coming years, uh, we've made a commitment to increase public R&D funding uh, to rebalance so that more of it is going outside the Greater Southeast. And the truth is, the Greater Southeast can only accommodate so much growth. And if you look at the pressure, the infrastructure pressure, the housing pressure around Cambridge, you can see that uh, very quickly, Cambridge already now needs to grow out across East Anglia. That's a wonderful opportunity for constituencies like mine in mid-Norfolk. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a need already to, to grow out from the... Uh, Greater Southeast Triangle. But, but here's the real point. These new technologies are not all anchored in Oxford, Cambridge, London. I mean, the space sector, it's a 16 billion sector employing 46,000 people. Genuinely, uh, it's headquartered in, you know, it's Leicester uh, Space Park, it's Cullum, Harwell, it's Cornwall, Goonhilly Earth Observation Station, Newquay Spaceport, it's Space Forge in South Wales, it's the Glasgow Satellite Manufacturing Catapult, it's Sutherland. So these new sectors, um, hydrogen is side. it's uh, coastal areas where we can do um, wind-powered hydrogen generation. You know, th this new economy goes all around the country, that's why it's, I think, so exciting. So that's the second part, it's nurturing those uh, clusters. But thirdly, if we're gonna be an R and D economy, I, I would argue that we're a very strong research powerhouse, but an R and D economy, then the D uh, will take you out of the the academic labs, both the academic lab of the UK, the Golden Triangle around the country. And, you know, in my sector, in life sciences, we've seen that it's gone from, or my old sector rather, it's gone from, um, you know, pure drug discovery. There's as much now going on around digital Medtronics devices, uh, uh, Philips, Siemens, heart monitors, uh, digitalized, personalized drug release systems. Now that takes you into advanced manufacturing, materials, uh, and that plays to the strengths of Manchester and Sheffield and uh, Glasgow. So I think if we're going to be a D economy, uh, the technology convergence is driving us out into areas where we've got really strong uh, technology and advanced manufacturing skills. So, I'm, you know, that's really exciting. In your area in the Northeast, where 25 years ago I did a lot of work on post coal mine closure deprivation, it's now genuinely it's home to some extraordinary companies like Chromec, Quantum DX. You see Northumbria. Uh, university shoot up the R&D league tables. It's now knocking on the door of the Russell Group, driving an incredible revival up in the Northeast of advanced manufacturing. So I, I, that's the second part of it. Um, and, and thirdly, I think there's a, there's a property opportunity. There are many, many investors internationally who would love to invest in UK property, infrastructure, and clusters. And at the moment, if you pick up the phone and say, I want to invest in the South Coast Marine Technology Cluster, there isn't anyone there saying, yes, we'll, we'll, we, you know, we can take your funding. You can ring an individual university, you can fund an individual company, but I'm sure there's an opportunity for us, as is the DIT, mm. for us to get much more funding in. And then that question on horizon Europe and value for money versus if we go our own way versus staying in. Uh, well, look, let, let me declare that, um, you know, personally, I, I plead guilty to wanting to have our cake and eat it. I mean, I want us to be in a very strong European collaborative ecosystem. And I want us to be able to use our UK and European science research, technology innovation for global good. That's why I set out the ratios there earlier. Uh, and I think there's a possibility if we, if we move uh, with bold vision, as the Prime Minister is uh, minded to do, I think what will happen is that not only will we allow our science and research to be globally impactful, uh, but also I think the European Union will, will see that um, we're committed to doing this, and I think it's more likely they'll pick up the phone and say, look, um, come back in and uh, let's do the ERC together and learn from some of the things we're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I think the worst of all worlds is just to sit and wait. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think we can have our cake and eat it. I think we can be a domestic powerhouse, a European player, and more of a global player. 
Well, we all love cake, so I think we can all agree with that. Now, let's take some questions. We've got plenty of people in the audience here as well. And um, we've got some roving microphones. If we could just get one to the chap down the front here. Thank you. Just found the glass here, thank you. If you could just say who you are and where you're from, please. Sure, uh, Robin Beston from Research Fortnite. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Freeman. That was um, yeah detailed and interesting. And just on what you last said about you know the worst of all worlds being t sitting on our hands and, and not doing anything with uh, with that money for Horizon. It has been two years now. We, you know we were, the the budget was 2.3 billion, I think, um, in this financial year, which you know a lot of that is is still unspent. So. Is there a cutoff point um, at which, you know, the government has to say, right, we're going to start spending this money in earnest? Obviously, there's been the 480 million already, but, you know, I think the science community would like to know when they're going to see more of that money. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robin. It's a, it's a great question. And let me start with the research community, because, you know, when I started 15-odd um, months ago in this role, uh, there was a pretty strong and overwhelming view from the research community. Um, keep pushing for Horizon, don't be distracted, uh, don't give the idea there's an alternative, keep pushing at it. I think the mood has changed over the last year. I think increasingly people have said the worst of all worlds is just to be benched and to be neither in nor active outside. So I, but I'm, I'm conscious that you know, I'm the minister for a very important sector and we need to work with them. And I, I think the mood is changing. It'll be interesting to see the response to this, this event. Um, second point, you know, we have, uh, you know, the, the way Horizon works is uh, we put in money, it's a bit front-loaded, so the, the contribution is uh, front-loaded and then the receipts flow through, there's a, there's a slight lag. So in this three years, um, we've already, through the guarantee and the various um, instruments that I set out earlier, I haven't got the figure, at my, you know, on my f fingertips, but we've already, um, we're at something like a billion, so there's a slight... Um, uh, there's, a, there's an under on what we would have put in, and there's a smaller under on what we would have got back. Um, so that's why we're looking at the, with the Treasury now at what we could deploy in this next year, two years, the rest of this CSR, uh, strategically to both support domestic UK research and international. So I, I'm not going to set out any numbers here today because it's a matter for the PM, the Chancellor, Treasury, Cabinet, and NSTC. And you can see from my earlier comments, the scale of the geopolitical and international significance of this. But let me be very clear, we are determined to honor that ring fence commitment the PM made last year. We're not gonna allow uh, monies that we would have received through Horizon to be taken off and spent on other areas. It'll be committed to UK R&D. The challenge is how and where best, and we are listening to the community. We set out this prospectus in the summer, and we're working closely with the community on where they would like to see us prioritize. Well, I think we can pick up the vibe from that. Uh, some other questions, yes. Um, go for uh, this lady at the front here, thank you. Hi, um, you've spoken a lot about how British universities will help make the UK a science superpower. Um, as I'm sure you know, international students make up almost a quarter of the total student population and help su subsidize both domestic study but also um, research R&D. Um, but both your colleagues, uh, the Prime Minister and Suella Barham and the Home Secretary have indicated that we should introduce a cap on foreign students. What are your thoughts on that and do we need to maintain the image that Britain is open uh, for people to come and study? Yes, talent's a big question. You mentioned this several times, George, and there's obviously some political tensions between the different areas of government on this. Yeah, look, I mean, there's no simple or single um, answer on this, but let me, let me deal with the question because... Uh, I made, as I made very clear, we are absolutely committed that uh, global science research excellence requires international collaboration. That's why the PM has been clear in supporting the science visas uh, and also in Ukraine. Uh, we've made a real point to make sure that Ukrainian researchers can come here and uh, be supported. And we, we understand that that global science piece requires both UK scientists to go internationally and international scientists to come here. Um, I'm not the Minister for Universities. Uh, but, um, you know, in terms of the university funding side, research and teaching, uh, we are very dependent on international revenues from international students. Uh, and there are some interesting uh, questions in there about, uh, you know, dependence on p particular countries, the China dependence. 
Uh, so I think there's a balance here between making sure that we are both nurturing international science research, uh, that's why I put such emphasis on the global talent piece, um, but also making sure that we're developing our domestic research ecosystem to support uh, UK students, UK research, and international research. And that's, that's a balance, uh, and we need to get it right. I would just share one story with you. I recently, uh, I was in Germany at the Max Planck Institute and met um, a brilliant, uh, I, I won't embarrass her by naming her, but a brilliant young British bioscientist, Oxford PhD. She's just won the prestigious Max Planck Fellowship. It's 10 year funding for her with a research assistant and a technician and she has the choice of any of the 80 Max Planck Institutes. So they're all bidding for her. And I said to her, did you, did you always want to come to Germany? She said, no, I've come for this fellowship. And she said, I'd much rather be in the UK. And you know, it won't be long before she'll have a German partner, she'll start a family and she'll have a You know, we, we need to make sure that we are internationally competitive in setting out fellowships for early stage. You know, I think it's quite tough for many of our early research career scientists, just at a time in life when things are you know, the most insecure, you're trying to start a career, perhaps start a family, uh, get a first home. Um, that time is when we've got the least security in the funding ecosystem for young research scientists. And I think we need to be a bit, uh, a bit bolder in saying, look, top people come here and we will support you. Mid-career, we've got huge pressure with, uh, you know, the ERC fellowship. We need to make sure we're attracting the best and keeping them here. Late stage, interestingly, we've got some brilliant British scientists working in uh, universities, but also public sector research establishments, being lured out by very big industry uh, offers. And we need to make sure that we are giving those people the career flexibilities to be able to stay, which they want to do. Uh, so I, I'm looking at mid, early, and late stage careers uh, as part of this mix. Thank you very much. Now let's try some clusters of our own and just do a couple of questions together. Um, there's two um, gentlemen just on the edge here. Can we take these two together just around on this side of the row here? Just making sure everyone gets their steps in today by going up and down as much as possible. Just these two gentlemen, just take these two together. And just if you could say who you are and where you're from, please. Um, thank you very much, Minister. That was a, a really passionate and powerful vision. Uh, very welcome. My name's Sean Walsh. I'm from Cancer Research UK. Um, one of the questions I had for you is your views and reflections on the role of medical research charities. Um, often overlooked, if I can stretch your football analogy, sometimes we don't even make the subs bench but we are absolutely um, unsung heroes, I'd say. And I, I would take Cancer Research UK as one example where you know, our research has generated over 900 million pounds worth of economic benefit, your point about global UK PLC. And our partnerships with the National Cancer Institute in the US on the global cancer challenge, which is daring to think differently about these challenges, is really powerful. But I think we're sometimes outside of the view of these discussions. Thank you. And we'll just take the other one from the gentleman behind. Hi, Charlie Clegg, Hawthorne Advisors. Um, on clusters, I'm thinking of space in particular. There's a need to um, work with local and devolved, in particular, governments. I'm just wondering what the state of relations is between you and the UK government and devolved and local governments and how you balance what's, uh, what helps and where that perhaps hinders the uh, creation and sustenance of clusters. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Two great questions. Um, like, uh, on charities, you make a really important point. It's a, it's, an, it's a unique strength of the UK ecosystem, actually, in medical research. Uh, when I was Minister for Life Science, I uh, put a lot of emphasis on this, that if you look at both, both in terms of deep blue sky science and research, but also patient care uh, and near patient um, medicine and health, uh, we have a huge strength. So on the deep science research space, you know, the MRC um, sits alongside the Wellcome Trust, um, Cancer Research UK, the biggest of a very big ecosystem of medical research charities. And as we think about how we deploy public funding, one of my conversations with UKRI is we need to make sure that we're aware of what CRUK, Wellcome, other charities are doing, and we're deploying public funding to support, but not duplicate, uh, that funding and, and to recognize that alongside that here we've got GSK and AstraZeneca and thousands of other companies so we need to make sure that we're we're cognizant of where the public research pound can add most value and we need to be doing the things that no one else is or can really do uh, but also closer to the patient I think the the smaller charities you know some of the 
like Cystic Fibrosis and some of those charities that are uh, leading in supporting patients with uh, some of the rare diseases, the, the untreatable diseases, they're also absolutely key to patient empowerment, to working with patients, enrolling them in trials, uh, to driving that accelerated access trials medicine piece. You know, in the end, if, we, if we're really going to deliver the life science dream of the UK as a research engine, patient compliance, patient support, patient empowerment, uh, patient support for data, for enrolling as patients did in, volunteers did in genomics, that'll all come down to patients. And patients typically will um, mediate through their charities. And I think there's, I, I, I coined the term philanthropharma uh, when I was life science minister. There's a huge opportunity for us to uh, allow our charities, medical research charities, to drive much more innovation, both in terms of research, but also medicine and healthcare. Uh, to your very well made point about uh, the union, look, I think I, I didn't dwell on it in this speech, but I think one of the exciting parts of this agenda is that it strengthens the union. Uh, and, uh, you know, Michael Gove made that point in the levelling up white paper. This is an area where we are absolutely stronger together. And if you talk to the Scottish research community, they will tell you uh, they really want to be in a United Kingdom uh, of research and innovation, or the vast majority will. Uh, and the truth is we've got real strengths, you know, in Northern Ireland, Belfast, uh, Queen's University, cancer research, the medical technology cluster in Scotland, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, um, and in South Wales, Swansea, Cardiff, North Wales. You know, there's, there's real strengths all around the country. Um, so to your point, actually, the, I think one of the first things I did when I first came into office 50 months ago was pick up the phone to the science ministers in the three devolved areas. They were quite surprised. It just seemed to me straightforward. And I said, look, we'll have political differences. Uh, there'll be things that you want to criticize me for. And I, I understand you've all got, you know, political games to play. But let's have a forum where we get together and we share and we talk and we discuss. Uh, and I just think it's, it's well, it was very welcome. Uh, next week, I'm going up to Scotland. Uh, I've already been to Wales and to Northern Ireland. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity for us here to, to support and nurture the pride of our devolved areas. Uh, you know, Wales is rightly proud, Scotland's rightly proud, Northern Ireland rightly proud. This isn't an either or, it's about us signaling that together uh, we will grow those clusters for the benefit of everyone. And I think we've got time for maybe just, is there any more we've got? Um, yeah, we'll just take, if we can just get maybe uh, one here and one here, and we'll just take those two briefly before we need to wrap up. So this gentleman here and this gentleman over here, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom Klaus Pritchard from the Pinsker Centre. Thank you so much, Minister, for your fascinating talk. And as a, the outreach director of a foreign policy think tank um, focusing on Israel, I welcome your thoughts on international cooperation in this sector. But one thing I wanted to draw your attention to would be the, f the private funding, uh, whether it be through donations or seeking to make profit from some of these fantastic innovations. How can we do that when the government is increasing taxes, particularly corporation tax? Do you think that will hurt the sector? Um, what are your views on that, Minister? Thank you very much. And then just this gentleman here for our final question. Uh, hi there, I'm uh, Peter, I'm from the Digital Catapult, part of the wider Catapult network, I'm sure you know. Um, my question was around ARIA and um, its decision to be based in London. I just wondered how that works with the levelling up agenda, given that, uh, you know, there's lots of talk about levelling up and it's great, the cluster talk is amazing, but uh, for that Blue Skies research, I just wondered how that's going to work with that uh, when it's being based in London. Just want your thoughts, thank you. Thank you very much. So do you want to take the overall economic environment, George, to start off with? Can I take ARIA first and then I'll do the wider Absolutely. economic piece? Yeah, so it's a really good point. Um, look, I'm really pleased we've, we've set up ARIA, we've passed the bill. It's a groundbreaking, it's quite a bold move, 800 million ring fenced. And this will not be government telling ARIA what to do. This will be a project to be led by uh, UK world-class scientists to do the bold science in, in the kind of free laboratory. Uh, that we're creating for them. And in Elan and Matt Clifford, we've, we've hired a CEO and a chair who combine international uh, leadership and respect and uh, strong understanding through Matt of the UK ecosystem. Uh, right now, they're in the process of hiring the first three or four core staff uh, in addition to chair and CEO. Um, uh, and they're going around the country looking at all these clusters, talking to all the research leaders. So right now, they're registered with a... Uh, I, you know, maybe a London address, but this isn't going to be a crick in London. Uh, ARIA will be 
uh, what they decide they want it to be. It won't be me deciding, uh, but they are very clear that the strength of the UK ecosystem is exactly what I've just talked about. And over the coming year, uh, I'm hoping they'll be going around the country in a roadshow and setting out and uh, developing their plans for that. So it's absolutely key that they tap into the broader ecosystem. So let me just turn to the wider point. Um, look, it's not for me, I'm not a treasury minister and I'm not gonna get into uh, doing the chancellor and treasury minister's jobs for them. It's hard enough uh, already. Uh, we are in a, obviously, a very difficult situation in terms of the cost uh, of the pandemic uh, huge public, uh, d you know, debts that we're all carrying, exacerbated by the Ukraine war. Um, uh, you know, I'm perhaps, I'm not sure that perhaps everyone understood that, you know, that war and the economic sanctions, I mean, it, it comes at a price. And, you know, Russia are, are being aggressive on energy, and so we're all suffering in Europe from a cost of living energy crisis. Uh, and the international recession is affecting all of us. So, uh, you know, I think we need to recognize that we're in a, a global economy, uh, but what I think I've set out today is um, an agenda that the reason the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are so supportive of it is that they absolutely see that this is about long-term economic resilience, long-term growth, uh, but also short-term growth. A lot of these sectors, if we get the regulatory framework right and we uh, do all the things that we're doing, you're already seeing um, you know, people beginning to say, this is exciting, we will commit more of our international fun uh, funding into the UK. So I, I think in the end, it's about creating that long-term confidence from investors, uh, countries, funds, all around the world, that the UK is serious about this agenda uh, and that we are serious about supporting people who take risks and grow and nurture companies. Uh, and I think that that message is heard loud and clear and the commitment to the uh, pension fund reforms, to connecting the city to our science base and to making sure that we're nurturing the scale-up agenda uh, that is a very powerful message. Uh, we've been seen historically as a great place to do the original early stage discovery science and the startups. This is about becoming a much bigger and more muscular player in terms of growing those companies here. And that will have huge economic benefits for the UK, just as we've done successfully in life sciences and in, in the digital economy. So I, I, uh, look, my job is to grow and build the industries of tomorrow. Uh, Treasury ministers have the difficult job of getting the public finance balance right every year and I'll leave them to make those decisions uh, in the forthcoming budget. Very wisely, and I think on that very upbeat and fantastic note, I'd like to thank George very much for coming for